We're in the book of James again today, and we're just going to preach through the book of James until we uh, get finished this summer. And I want to do that because I believe that the book of James is a book for maturity. It helps us grow up. Of course, the Bible is 66 books in one. If you have a Bible in your lap today, you have one book with 66 books contained. Genesis, the first book of the Bible, tells us how God started everything. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The last book of the Bible is the book of the Revelation, and that tells how God will end time as we know it, and we enter into an eternal life with Him. One of those books is the book of James. It's only five chapters in length. And it is written primarily from a pastor in Jerusalem in the first generation who was a half-brother of our Lord Jesus Christ. They shared the same mother, but obviously had different fathers. Joseph was James' dad, Joseph of Mary. And uh, he was uh, succeeded another guy named James who Herod persecuted the church, arrested the pastor, and beheaded him. And after that, he felt like that really made a lot of people happy and certainly hurt the Christians, and he arrested Peter. And you might read the story about Peter. Uh, The Lord delivered him out of uh, Herod's hand. But James took over after him, we believe, according to the stories of Josephus. We believe that that is what happened. But James is writing now because persecution has come to the people of God, and they're wavering. They're wondering if it worth it to continue serving the Lord. Is the trials of difficulties of being a Christian, should we continue on? And he tells them, you need to grow up. You need to strengthen. And he gives them at least 10. And I think you could find even more little, uh, little items or, or attributes of mature Christians and things that God uses to make us mature in our walk with the Lord. Number one... He told them that trials and suffering mature us. Now, I don't like trials. You don't like trials, but we have them. And God gives us trials to strengthen us and make us stronger as Christians. No pain, no gain. That goes in the physical realm. That goes in the spiritual realm. And all of us have had our share of trials. I remember years ago thinking, boy, I tell you what, I've had a really an easy life. But then trials came, and it put a real gut punch in me. It challenged me to grow up spiritually. It it, it identified if I really loved God, if I was really in this thing because I loved Him, or I just loved what He gave to me. I think about this. I was praying for our young adults and our young Uh, our young people and our young married couples and those who just have children recently in recent years. I'm excited. I remember those days. We have nine children. Our oldest would be 27. Our youngest is eight now. But I remember when they were just a little stair step, really small. And uh, was thinking about the, the challenges of getting them back to church on a Sunday night or getting him on Wednesday night or making sure they were here on Sunday school and the challenges of getting them together. And I, I sure admire moms and dads who make that commitment, who are there. And, you know, kids don't drive themselves. They need a mom and dad to help them and encourage them. And I, I thank the Lord for that. I appreciate so much the work that goes into that. But oftentimes, Christians especially... When God gives us something, we fall more in love with the gift than the giver. When I see a mom and dad, God gives them a beautiful baby, and then they start missing church. They start using that little baby as an excuse, or that child, or their schooling, or their homework, or something, as a reason why they're not going to be faithful to the Lord. And it makes me nervous. Sometimes you get a guy and they, he gets a good job and he gets promoted or they get a new career and, and things are going good in that career. They fall so much in love with the career that God gave them that they forget about the one who gave it to them. See, people that, that are, they, they start dating someone, all of a sudden now they start missing spiritual things that one time they would have done, but now they don't do it anymore. They have now that early on we are scrapping to get everything together and now we're in our middle age and and we're doing better financially have more and we find to have more toys and more things and more things to occupy our life rather than to get back to the thing that that God gave us to do. We fall more in love with the gift than the giver. One thing usually cripples me in that and that is a difficult time. Suffering. 
And whenever we're going through suffering or difficult trials, James says, listen, number one, you praise the Lord through them. Number two, you pray in the middle of them. And number three, you persevere. Trials mature us. Number two, the scripture matures us. When we get into the word of God, the word of God gets into us and strength is a byproduct. We'll be stronger and we mature as the word of God gets in our hearts. I thank you for being here this morning. And believe it or not, even though you're listening to me and you're listening to your Sunday school teacher or your discipleship class, when you leave, you'll be stronger as a Christian because you've heard the word of God. Your faith will be increased if you listen at all. And I'd like to say a few of you come in here with your cell phones. And let me encourage you to put those things off and put them down, especially in the back sections. I've heard several people complain to me. say, Pastor, it seems like when I go here, I can't even pay attention. You've got kids and people are just playing with their cell phone the whole time. Don't do that. Have enough maturity to listen to the Bible. You don't have to like me, but I hope you listen to the scriptures. Because whenever someone gets in the Word of God, there's three byproducts. Number one, you'll find that a strong Christian, a mature Christian, will very, very early understand that he'll have a, he'll have a blameless separation. They'll be separated to God from the world. They'll be benevolent in their spirit. They'll be giving. They'll be interested in, in sharing with other people. You know, you find a mature person, they're not in it. My name is Jimmy, take all you give me. Who can I get something from? Who, who can I have that? No, no, mature people usually understand that God's given me enough so I can help myself and help others as well. They have a generous spirit. And the Word of God does an amazing work in the lives of people, but you need to do it. He said, if you hear these things, happy are ye if ye do them. Be doers of the word. If God points something out to us, change it. He said many people on a Sunday morning, they come to church or a Sunday night or even their own Bible reading. And God shows us in our reading and in the message, you've got a problem, John. Something's not right in your life. Now I have an option. I'm either going to do it or not going to do it. No, most of us know what to do, but we don't put it into practice. He said, that's like a man who goes and looks in the mirror and sees that he's messed up. He sees boogers in his eyes. He sees his hair's messed up. He sees his eyes are matted. He sees that his teeth are scummy, and he looks and sees all those things, and then he doesn't do anything about it. just turns around and walks away from the mirror and goes out and takes on the day and all of his friends that see him. You say, that guy's an idiot. But the same foolishness is whenever we hear what God wants us to do, we don't make adjustments. When God says, hey, listen, you need to forgive that person, and we don't forgive them. When God provokes our heart about getting rid of something that we know is negative and wrong and contra uh, counterproductive to our walk with the Lord, and we don't do anything about it, we, we still keep it in our lives. Then he says, that's just that's the same way. You've got to be a doer of the word in order to experience the blessings of God, what they ought to be in your life. Now, I want to go to chapter 2, which uh, Brother Colson has read with us. And I want to show you the, the next area. When someone gets into the Word of God, there's maturity. Whenever someone has difficult times and they persevere and they pray and they praise God through them, they're mature. They're showing maturity and they're getting maturity. When someone reads the Bible and applies the Bible, they're not only showing maturity, but they're gaining more maturity. But in chapter 2, James, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit of God, says, listen, there's another area, and that is sincerity and sensitivity to people. He says, whenever somebody doesn't treat people equitably and right and impartial, they're showing that they're immature. A mature Christian is somebody who will be equitable with other people. And James tells us that in James chapter 2, verse number 1. Would you look at it with me if you would, please? The Bible tells us, my brethren, have not the faith of our Lord Jesus Christ. And I want you to notice what else this says there. The next four words, read it with me, would you please? The Lord of, with respect of persons. He's telling them, he says, we're going to spend 13 verses talking to you and talking to me about our attitude toward people around us. You know, that God is very concerned that my relationship with him is right. He's concerned that my relationship with you is right. 
I think when someone is sick, God gives them an option in James chapter 5 to him that is sick, call for the elders and let them pray over him, anoint him with oil in the name of the Lord. And their prayer of faith shall save the sick. I think it's very important that Christians need to know if you're, if you're sick, you might want to call for someone to pray for you. And we anoint you with oil. If I anoint you with oil, it's not a, if the oil doesn't, doesn't have any medicinal healing on you. But what it is, is in the Bible, when someone, when a priest was made a priest, they would anoint him with oil. When a king was pronounced to be a king, they would anoint him with oil. And what it was, it was telling God, we understand this person needs God's help. But you know, whenever someone does that, there's two things God wants them to do. Number one, before they would they would be anointed with oil and to be prayed for by the leaders of the church, they're supposed to examine and see if there's any sin in their heart against God. Because sin is always first against God. That's why a man or a woman can forgive someone, their spouse who's committed adultery on them. Because sin was first against God. That's why you can forgive someone who's stolen from you. Because stealing is first against God. David said, against thee and thee only have I sinned and done this evil in thy sight. By the way, that's why everybody needs to be saved. Because all of us are guilty of sin against God. But the second thing that God tells the person when they get ready to be prayed for, anointed with oil, is to evaluate one another. He says, confess your faults one to another and pray one for another that ye may be healed. I think one of the reasons that people continue on, oftentimes in sickness, not always, and please, do, this is not a judgment on anyone, and I wouldn't want you to judge me on this, I'm not judging you on this. But before someone is healed, he says, one thing, make sure you're right with God. Do you have any sin that's confessed? Number two, if you have a fault, what is a fault? You ever heard the San Andreas fault? What is it? It's a break in the earth. And if you have a fault with another brother or sister, another person, that you have a break in earthly relationship, God says, confess that. Yes, I do have a problem with them. I don't appreciate. They stole from me. They did this. They hurt me. Confess that you got a fault with them. And then God says, pray for them that you can be healed. You know, on the cross, we know that what Jesus did on the cross, he chose to suffer for our sin so we can have eternal life with God. But number two, he prayed for us on the cross. He prayed. He said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Now, i got a few prayers I like to pray when someone hurts me. Lord, please help them know how bad they hurt. Or my other prayer is like, Lord, please take them off the planet. (laughs) Lord, just get them out of my life. Just take them away from me. No. Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. How about you and I when we confess our fault? And you know, God is very concerned how I treat. Not just him, but you. We all have a vertical relationship that's with God and a horizontal relationship that's with each other. Jesus said in John chapter 13 and verse number 35, By this shall all men know that you are my disciples, if you have love for the Lord. Is that what it says? No, if you have love one for another. One of the reasons that this world, the badge of discipleship, this world will recognize, if I'm really a true Christian, the way they know if I love him is if I love you. If I love my neighbor, if I love my friend, if I love my enemy. When I'm quick to criticize and to, and to, to complain and to, to be uh, hurtful and wrong in my words or my actions toward other people. And James is going to say, let's talk about maturity. Yes, trials make you mature. Yes, the word of God will make you mature. But so is your treatment of other people. And it starts with our view of God. The Bible says only by this concept and this sin comes contention. What is that? What is that sin? Pride. Only by pride comes contention. You know, when you have problems with another, you're looking at pride. Some on your part, no doubt, and some on other people's part. 
When you have arguments and fighting, and today we'll, uh, we'll have that in our world that we live in. We'll have unkind te- uh, Twitters and Facebooks and things that we'll say and people will say about everybody because they're full of themselves. They're full of their own thinking, their own feelings, their own desires, and that creates all kinds of issues in the heart of somebody. You know, one thing that will really put you on your knees is if you get a real good view of God. I think the key of this whole passage is in the four words, the Lord of glory. What is your opinion of God? Can you take your Bibles and turn to Isaiah chapter 6, if you would, please? Isaiah chapter 6. Isaiah is in the middle of your Bible. If you are going to the book of Psalms, just go toward the back again for a couple books, and you'll come to Isaiah chapter 6. You know, all of us, we have respect of persons. We, we, if, if Warren Buffett came in here this morning and sat beside you on one side and Oprah Rem- Winfrey sat beside you on the other side, and they just, you're sitting there in your seat in church this morning, would that change the way that you listen to the service today? It would. You know why? Because we respect these people. Maybe we don't agree with them, but we respect them. One of the richest men in all the world sitting beside you. One of the richest ladies in all the world, the most recognized, one of the the most recognized ladies on the planet. She's sitting now beside you. You'd probably open your songbook. You'd probably sing. (laughs) Some of you struggle to do that. You just stand there and look at us, wait for us to finish the song. You'd probably, when the offering came by, you'd probably find something. Why? Because you would respect the presence of people around you. Now, I'm not being critical. I would do the same thing. We kind of give certain people more respect than other people. And that happened here. It was happening in the church at large. It was happening, and James knew it. He knew human, he knew humanity. He also knew the church. And that happens right here at First Baptist Church. It, happens, it happened in the early church. And I think that's why God points it out to us. But I do believe what changes everything is our view of God. If we see the Lord of glory with who he is, then all of a sudden we change our posture real quick. Look, if you would please, at Isaiah chapter 6, and the Bible tells us, And the year that Uzziah died, why don't you notice something? Isaiah loved Uzziah. Uzziah was his king. He was his provider, he was his his leader, and he loved Uzziah. And Uzziah was someone, understandably, to be loved. Now, he died as a leper. He really, he went from being a hero to a zero because he got off his rug and tried to do something he wasn't supposed to do. You can read the story in the book of the Chronicles. But Uzziah, overall, was an amazing king. He had an amazing leadership in 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 the nation of Israel, and Isaiah loved him. But when I, Uzziah was not there anymore, then he could see the Lord. High and lifted up. Look at chapter 6, verse 1. Sitting on his, upon his throne, high and lifted up, and his train filled the temple. And above it he stood seraphims, and each had six wings. And twain he covered his face, and with twain he covered his feet, and with twain did fly. And one cried unto another and said, Holy, 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 the Lord of hosts, the whole earth is full of his what? And the post of the door moved at the voice of him that cried, and the house was filled with smoke. He said, you know what, I, and of course, I don't know literally or or figuratively or in his thought or in his vision. Now Uzziah is no longer there. He sees God for who he is, and he sees all the glory of God. And notice his response in verse number five. Would you read it with me? Then said I, woe is me, for I am undone. Because I am a man of unclean lips, and I dwell in the midst of people of unclean lips. For mine eyes have seen the king. What was the response that Isaiah had whenever he saw God in his rightful place? It was humility. He said, woe is me. You know, you and I, our opinion of ourselves really will govern how we treat other people. If you have a high opinion of yourself, then you will have very little patience with other people in your life. 
If you are, if you feel like you're self-sufficient, you've got enough money to take care of things for a while, you'll get frustrated with the poor in your presence. If you've got it all going on and you can read and you can type and you can, you can do math and, and you, you're just really good at stuff, sometimes you have a hard time with someone else who struggles with their words, struggles to read. I've seen this as a teacher years ago. I was a teacher for 11 years, and sometimes I would see an advanced student, and then I would see another student who was struggling, and they would just, the advanced student would get so frustrated. Oh, come on, man, don't you get that? How many times does she have to go over that? What's wrong with you, dude? Man, what's the matter with you? You know what, has, what, what changes everything is whenever they get a right opinion of God. They're full of themselves, and now they have no patience with other people. They don't treat other people correctly. With that in the backdrop, real quickly, we'll take a few moments. Let's look at chapter 2, and let's go back to James, chapter 2, if you would, please. And I want you to share just a few, look at a few thoughts here. The Lord of glory with respect of persons. He's going to talk about partiality. And the key to dealing with partiality and impartiality is going to be your opinion of God. Proverbs chapter 22, verse number 2, the Bible says, The rich and the poor meet together. And do you know what the rest of the verse says? The Lord is the maker of them all. When we realize that God is the potter, we're the pot. We realize that he's the, he's the one who makes everything. He put us on the planet together. Then we can have a, we know where he is, then we can be okay with other people within our sphere of influence. Let's look real quickly at verse number 2. He says, he gives an illustration. For if there come into your assembly a man with a gold ring and goodly apparel, nice clothes, and there come also a poor man in a vile raiment. And vile raiment just means his clothes are dirty. And ye have respect to him that weareth the gay clothing. Of course, that word has been changed in recent days, but it means the bright, the press, the nice clothing. And you say to him, sit here in a good place. And say to the poor, sit thou here, or sit here under my footstool. Are ye not then partial in yourselves, and are become as judges of evil thoughts? Hearken, my beloved brethren, hearken, Christian. Hath not God chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith, and heirs of the kingdom, which he hath promised to them that love him? But ye have despised the poor. Do not rich men oppress you and draw you before the judgment seat? They take you to court. They take their attorneys and they pull you into judgment seats. Do they not more readily blaspheme that worthy name by which ye are called? If you fulfill the royal law, according to the scripture, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself, you do well. But if you have respect of persons, ye commit sin and are convinced of the law as transgressors. A couple thoughts here real quick. We're talking about maturity. Maturity, what makes me mature is when I understand who God is and I learn to treat people with equity. What shows my maturity is the same thing. Yes, I, I get my, my maturity strengthened by trials, by the word of God, and by sincerity and sincerity and, and, and sensitivity to the needs of others. Paul tell, uh, James says here, look here. He says, you have a man come into the services he looks nice, dressed good, smells good, everything's fine. And you say, hey, man, come on in. Let me get you a good seat. And you see someone whose clothes are not good. They're, it's obvious they're, they're, not, they're, they're not clean. And you say, you know, hey, fella, why don't you sit over here? He said, I have a problem with that. The God of heaven has a problem with that. He said, then... If you do that, that's sin. That's, that, is, that is showing partiality. Now, all of us have prejudice to deal with. We judge people because of their skin color, because of their ethnic background, because of their economics. We size people up continually. But you know, one thing I know about my God and you know about your God is he is not a respecter of persons. You can read Romans chapter 2, verse 11, he'll tell you he's not a respecter of persons. Read Acts chapter 10 and verse number 34, Leviticus chapter 19 and verse number 15 and verse 18. You'll find out real quickly that God is not a respecter of persons, and nor should I be. 
Then he goes on to say a little bit of theology. He says, don't you understand that God has made the poor of this world richer in faith? He said, those are the, those are the people that are, are, are in line for a, a rich inheritance. Abraham Lincoln said this. He said, God must really love the poor because he made so many of them. I have been, by the grace of God and by the generosity to be able to represent the Lord Jesus, the, even this church and the church in Long Beach, to many places of the world, to poor places, to third world countries. And I have seen some of the happiest people on the planet that don't have two nickels to put together. I've seen some of the most generous people or people have nothing really to give. You almost don't want to take what they give you because you know what a sacrifice it is from them. But the Bible says that God has chosen the poor. You know, rich people have competition. God has competition with the rich. It's their money. It's their possessions. It's the status that they get. I rarely ever travel first class. Every once in a while I'll be burnt, bumped up and just because of a miles, but this just rarely ever happens. But I find that the people in first class are not as quick to talk to me about the gospel as the people in coach. The people in first class, you know, I remember the other day I was a young businessman and he, he was flying uh, to Mexico City every Monday or Sunday night and then he comes back uh, on Thursday and he has a family in Chicago. And boy, I, uh, I have witnessed to hundreds of people on airplanes. And uh, I started talking to him. He says, if you don't mind, I'm going to take a nap. Good to talk to you, John. Turn, put his eyes on there, and he put his thing on there, and that was it. You know, what, something about wealth creates a pridefulness that you don't think you need God. You don't think you need other people. But yet there's something about not having what we need that oftentimes shows us, man, I really need the Lord. And oftentimes it's the poor that depend upon the Lord so much. We kind of judge a book by its success, and we have a prosperity gospel today that is taught and preached that, you know, God doesn't want anyone poor. You have to tell it to Jesus who didn't even have a place to lay his head. God will take care of us, but he's not interested in making everybody. Now, God can bless people. But just because you're blessed financially doesn't mean you're right with God. God's chosen the poor of this world, rich in faith. And oftentimes... The poor people that maybe did not have all their act together, and didn't, but they had a love and a faithfulness toward God will be people who will be rewarded in the presence of the Lord one day. He says, now, John, if you are partial toward people, there's two things you have to look forward to. Number one, you are a transgressor of the law. You have, you have broken, you have sinned against the royal law of loving your neighbors yourself. When I mistreat somebody, walk around two legs on this planet, I have broken the royal law to love my neighbor and self. Number two, I have opened myself up for God's judgment. I don't know about you, but wherever judgment is, I want to be somewhere else. So James is very strong. He says, you know, mature people learn to treat others with equity. How do you do on that? How do I do on that? Are we like our Lord Jesus, who is not a respecter of persons? Mature people get over that and say, you know what, I'm going to love people because God loved them. The rich and the poor meet together, but the Lord is the maker of them all. Let's pray together, can we? Thank you for the way you listen to the word of God this morning. I appreciate you turning your Bibles. appreciate you reading with me. appreciate you being attentive to those around you. With our heads bowed and eyes closed, I want to thank you, every one of you for listening. But I'd like to ask a couple questions real quickly. In a room like this, there are two groups of people generally, people that are on their way to heaven and people who are not. People that have been forgiven by God and people who are not. People who have been born again and people who have not got their second birth yet. Now, God loves everybody and he wants everybody to be saved. He wants everybody to have eternal life. And if you're here today, you're not sure if you were to die, you'd go to heaven. We're concerned about that. 
Because everyone goes into eternity either with their sin or with God's Son. How many say, Pastor, I do know for sure if I died, I would go to heaven. I have that confidence. I know when it was that I accepted God's gift of eternal life. Would you raise your hand if you know that? Good. Amen. You put your hands down. Thank you. Is there anyone who would say, Pastor, I'm not sure. With heads bowed and eyes closed, I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven, but I am concerned about it. Pastor, please pray for me. Would you lift your hand this morning, hold it up, and let me pray for you. God bless you. Anyone else? Hold your hand up. Say, Pastor, I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. I see your hand and your hand and your hand, sir. Anyone else? Say, Pastor, I, that's a hard question. I don't know the answer to it. I'm not sure if I died today, I'd go to heaven. Pastor, please pray for me. Anyone else? Hold your hand up. Let me pray for you. God bless you, man. I'm so glad you're here. Thank you for being humble enough to ask us to pray for you. How many say, Pastor, I, I can see something in the service today that God has, he's shown me in the mirror of his word something I need to change in my attitude, in my perspectives, and I'm willing to do it. If God would speak to me about it, I'm speaking to him about it, and I'm getting that straightened out. I'm going to ask him for help in that area. Would you raise your hand? Good. God bless you. Maybe you've been saved and you need to get baptized. Today is a good day to do that. I hope you'll respond to the Lord. Let's stand together to our feet. We'll pray together. Then the trio will sing. Our